Uh, my name is Emery Stagner, and I am a rocket geek. I do not actually work directly on rockets, but I work on satellites. I work for a company called Northrop Grumman, a very large company, uh, headquarters actually right here in Alexandria. And I build satellites for NASA. Okay, that's just that so. right there. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to have a presentation today, um, and then your teachers are looking out for five kids from their class that is going that are going to get to go and have lunch and ask some more questions and find out more about space during lunchtime. But we're looking for those who are listening, who are focused and really into it, okay? So thank you. All right. So I build satellites for NASA if I work for Northrop Grumman. Alright? I've gotten to see a couple of rocket launches and I currently have I think three satellites that I've worked on that are still operating up in space. All right, One of them has been up there for 12 years. It was only designed to be up there for one. One of them has been up there for eight years. And one of them I can't talk about. How about that? So I can't talk about it because it's classified. So we do do some work for that's not NASA. And I can't tell you who, but it's not NASA. But it's really cool. OK, that's as much as I can say about it. But so I wanted to show off, start off with you guys with a cool video uh, of a rocket launch. And um, we haven't gotten to try the audio yet, but all right, so you get to hear it. This is from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, OK? This is the largest rocket that the United States can currently fly. It's called the Delta IV Heavy. I want you to notice something there. There's things there that aren't technical. There's things there that are art. Did you see that? Yeah. Pictures on the outside of the fairing? All right, we're going to talk about that. That's really important. All right, so Vandenberg Air Force Base is in California. And the United Launch Alliance launches a couple of different kinds of rockets. And this is the biggest thing out there. Look at that fireball. Now that rocket actually on fire. Is that so cool? Yep. That launched a satellite for what's called the National Reconnaissance Office. They're looking back down at the world. Like, like Hubble Space Telescope? You guys remember the Hubble Space Telescope? Okay. All right, they got satellites that big that are looking back down at us. Right. See, it's got three, three boosters side by side, right? And this this uh, rocket burns hydrogen and oxygen. Anybody know what hydrogen and oxygen makes when you combine them? Gray shirt. Um, H two. Oh, what is it? What is it? Water. All right. So this rocket doesn't produce any smoke. This rocket just produces water vapor. See, there's no smoke trail. That's actually the most efficient chemical uh, uh, thing that we can build. That's cool. All right? Okay. So right there, they're actually going through the speed of sound, and the water is actually in the atmosphere. It's actually condensing behind the rocket. By now, they're going, at this point, they're going about 5,000 miles an hour. So the first two, the two outside stages burn off and separate. And the middle one keeps going and sends the rocket, sends the rest of the satellite all the way to orbit. That's cool. All right, that's a cool video. Um, so let's talk a second about why we do things in space. All right, there's a couple of things that we do. One, we look up. Okay, we look out at the planets and the stars and galaxies. We look at things in visible light. We look at things in ultraviolet light. We look at things in radio waves. OK, yes. OK, there is a continuum of light that goes from radio waves all the way up to x-rays and even beyond. And it's the frequency of how fast the light oscillates. All right? Radio waves oscillate very slowly. The light that we see with our eyes oscillates much quicker, but even then there's a whole range of bands. 
You guys know the names of the spectrum? Have you ever seen a rainbow? Yeah. You ever notice that the rainbow is always in the same order? Yeah. You know what that's called? Roy G. Bibb. Two points for Gryffindor. All right. So <laughs> red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Red is the lowest. Gr uh, violet, which up into the ultraviolet is where uh, is the highest frequencies, all right? So you get a whole range of frequencies there, and that's what we see with our eyes. But if you looked at the whole spectrum, all right, from radio waves to x-rays, and it was, let's say that that spectrum was as wide as this front row of seats, the visible light would be like the gap in between here and here. So we only see with our eyes this much of the spectrum that's huge, all right? So when we look at the sky in different frequencies, in radio waves, in ultraviolet, we see things that we don't see with our eyes, and we learn things that we didn't know otherwise. Question? Samantha, you said that you see like 50,000 times more light than us. Who can? Samantha Beaver. Yeah, there's a lot of different animals that can see uh, much dimmer light, and they can see different frequencies. Some animals actually see into the, into the infrared, so they can see infrared is actually what is we know as heat. Okay, so things that are warm emit infrared light. We can't see it with our eyes, but we can feel it, right? And when we look at it with satellites, we can see it because we make the satellites so that they can see those things. The Hubble Space Telescope currently sees things mostly in the visible light range. All right, so what we see with our eyes. And so we get beautiful pictures from Hubble. There's a new satellite that's being built that's going to go up into space, a new big space telescope. Anybody know the name of the new space telescope that's being built? Do you know? Um, you have a question. I have two things. One, it, the satellite's called the Webb, and two, yep. astronomers are using the light spectrum to identify new planets. Yes, they are. Uh, the search for new planets is one of the most amazing things that we're currently doing in space. Um, and so the James Webb Space Telescope, named after somebody who was named James Webb, obviously, right? He was a NASA administrator at one point. So the James Webb Space Telescope is currently being built at Goddard Space Flight Center, only about, what, 20 or 30 miles from here. Um, and um, I actually have co-workers of mine who are engineers that are working on that. They're doing testing. They're building uh, some of the instruments. Um, and uh, one of my very good friends is working uh, as a systems engineer. So he's actually de helping design the Hubble Space Telescope, and he's designing how it'll work. All right, so not just uh, how, it's, how it's being built, but how they're going to use it, okay? So James Webb, it, Hubble, let's see, let's back up. Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth. Now, when you orbit the Earth, where's my ball? Hold on. I got some stuff I'm going to show you guys. So let me get my toys. Uh, I got toys. Hey, you know, big guys have toys too. All right, so this is a little squishy ball. And you can't see really, probably in this light, but it's shaped like a moon or an asteroid, okay? So uh, I need a volunteer who's sitting on the end of the row. You can come out. All right. I'm going to toss this ball to you, and I need everybody else to watch and see what kind of a shape this ball travels. All right? Ready? I'll try and throw it right. Okay, there you go. What kind of a shape was that? Red shirt. Yes, you. It looks right from here. <laughs> in a semicircle. It traveled in an arc. Very good. Thank you. All right. So it traveled in a semicircle. If I threw it harder, it would travel in a bigger semicircle. But eventually it would come back and land on the earth. Right? How about if I threw it really, really hard? Let's say harder than I can really actually throw it. I could throw it a thousand miles. It would still hit the earth. What if I threw it so fast that, remember the earth is a sphere, right? Okay, so the earth has a curve. So the earth curves away. If I threw the ball fast enough that the, it was going and it was falling toward the earth at the same speed that the earth was falling away from it because it's curved and it never hit the earth, what would I have? An orbit. An orbit, right? So all it is is throwing something at 17,500 miles an hour, which I can't do. <laughs> That's why it takes rockets. It takes an awful lot of energy to get up that fast, right? So satellites are launched on rockets because you have to go super fast. 
super, super big. Right? And that's if you just want to go around the Earth. If you want to get away from the Earth, you've got to go even faster than that. You've got to go about 25,000 miles an hour. All right? It takes so much more energy to go even twice as fast. It takes 10 times as much energy to go twice as fast. It's really, really hard because you have all this velocity that you've got to get and you have to accelerate and you have to keep accelerating until you get to the speed that you need to get to in order to get away from the Earth. So the last satellite that I got to work on was called LCROSS. And LCROSS went to the moon. All right? um, what we were doing on the moon is a really interesting problem because we were trying... We were trying to find out whether or not there was water on the moon. Now, we were trying to do that by looking at something that other satellites had seen, but they had only seen it from a long way away, 100 miles or more, some of a 1,000 miles or more. And they had seen these, what looked like in the spectrum, right? We talked about the spectrum. They had looked at the spectrum and they had said, that looks like hydrogen, but it's so cold and it's so dark, we can't really tell. So what we need to do, NASA says, what we need to do is figure out how to get to where they saw this hydrogen and either measure it directly or, you know, drive into this crater with a rover, right? Or what we said we would do, we would take something really big and we would slam it into the crater and we would knock up all this dust and we would do it so hard with such a big thing that the dust would go up for miles and miles and it would go up actually into the sunlight and then it gets hot and then it gets bright and then we can look at it and see aha there's water there all right so the l cross mission was about finding something called ground truth all right now think about what I'm saying. Ground truth as opposed to remote sensing. Remote sensing means I can look at the Earth or I can look at the moon, okay? And I can say, this looks like, I understand what's there. It looks like water, or it looks like plants, or it looks like rocks, okay? If we're looking back at the Earth, we have an easy way to go find out what's actually there because we can go to the place where that satellite saw something, and we can go see what's really there. We can measure it directly, right? We can go measure the plants. We can go see what the soil composition is. We can go see how much water's there, right? If it looks like a road, we can go say, what kind of a road is it? Concrete or that? Or is it dirt? Right? We can go find all that stuff out. But on the moon, it's harder. The moon's to over 200,000 miles away, and it takes a couple of days to get there. Now, men have been to the moon, but not for 40 years. Right? So it's been quite a while, and only 12 people have ever been to the moon. And we were there for maximum three days. All right, six different times. The first guys who were there were, anybody know their names? Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. The third guy didn't actually get to go down to the moon. He orbited around the moon and waited for them to come back up. His name is Michael Collins. Very good. So... Um, they measured things and they brought back rocks. They brought back um, some small number of pounds of rocks, 50 or 60 pounds. That's about all the rocks we have from the moon. They just didn't bring back very much. So to go find out whether or not there was water, and this is on the south pole of the moon. All right. So the moon, the Earth is, has a tilt. You guys have seen a globe, right? And the Earth is kind of tilted over, like 22 degrees, right? The moon is only tilted at one degree, so like straight up and down. So if there's a crater right on the South Pole, and there's a couple of them, the sunlight is going straight across, right? Because the, the pole's here, the sun's over there, the sunlight goes straight across. It never hits the bottom of this crater, all right? The bottoms of these craters that are on the North and South Pole of the Moon, where the sunlight never hits them and there's no atmosphere, they are the coldest places in the solar system. They are colder than Pluto, all right? So trying to see what's down there when the rim of the crater is very bright and the bottom of the crater is very dark, it's very hard. Because mostly we want to see what's lit on the moon. We don't want to see what's dark. And so we design our cameras to look at the 
most of what's there is very bright. The moon reflects back a lot of light because there's a lot of aluminum and there's a lot of titanium on the moon and it reflects light really well. So the moon's pretty bright. So how do we do that? Well, here's what we do. We take a rocket and a satellite and we don't separate them. We let the satellite take control of the rocket and we steer that rocket so that it's gonna go into the south pole of the moon and we let go. And it goes in and it hits the moon. It weighs two tons. It's 45 feet tall and 15 feet in diameter. So it's, it's as tall as this auditorium, maybe taller, and as big around as this set of seats. All right, so it's this big around and that high. And we hit the moon at 5,500 miles an hour. And we made gigajoules of impact. Just so much energy that it was really hard to even measure. And we knocked that dirt. We made a big crater. We made a little crater for the moon. But we made a crater, and we knocked all this dirt up into the sunlight. It got hot, it got bright, and we can look at it. And then, our little satellite that had been controlling this thing, we flew through it. We flew through that debris that was coming up, all the dust and stuff. We flew through it, and we said, ah, now we're actually measuring the real dirt that was really in the bottom of that crater. And we found water. We found ice. We found methane. We found mercury. We found silver. They didn't expect to find anything but water and aluminum, right? They found aluminum, but they, I mean, they found all kinds of stuff that we did not, we didn't expect to find, right? That was a great piece of science because not only was it successful, it was so successful that we found things we weren't even looking for, right? So here I'm going to show you a video of the launch. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't have any audio. Um, but here's what I want you to notice about this. This uh, video was taken from about a quarter of a mile away. Watch the bottom segment there that's all white. Watch how it's when the rocket lights off. There's the water. Look at it. That's all ice. The bottom of that rocket is brown. The white stuff was all ice. Now watch, the shockwaves are about to hit the camera tower. Here you can see the camera. That's a big tower that this camera is mounted in, right? So that's pretty cool. That was the, uh, that was the launch of the L-Cross mission. Oh, here I have another one. This one is from a, a camera on the outside of the rocket. Now this is a couple minutes longer. There's all the ice falling away, and there's a lot of steam. Yeah, the camera's like all shaking around. So the camera, the camera's communicating back to the ground with radio waves, it's wireless, right? So there's, uh, there's uh, Cape Canaveral down in Florida. Now Florida's really wet, right? It's really humid down there. And so all this humidity collects on the outside of the rocket because the inside of the rocket is 250 degrees below zero. It's liquid oxygen, right? So we're still picking up speed here. Now you can see that there's some water forming uh, on the lens of the camera. Yeah. Right? This stuff's melting, the camera's kind of cold. There we went through some clouds. Watch the clouds race away. This is pretty cool. So we're still, we're now going, um, probably almost going a thousand miles an hour by now. All right? Um, I don't, you know what? I don't, I may have some sing still pictures of the moon. I don't have a lot of video of that. All right. So, clouds are pretty cool, huh? Oh yeah. All right, we jump ahead a little bit. Here we are up in space, and they're about to turn the camera. There's more than one camera here, so this camera's looking down. And they got another camera that's looking up. Why is it all crazy colors? Oh. Uh -huh. We're just losing radio. The, the, the radio signals are kind of hard to get when you're. I mean. We're really far away at this point. Is that the moon? No, that's the curve of the Earth. Oh, You're looking at space on the right and the Earth on the top left. Right? All right, so that, that little, the little thing on the left is just burning off excess, you know, keeping the just a pressure vent. So the, the, as this stuff gets hotter, um, it, it expands and you need to release the pressure. So, they cut the pressure vent off. 
and here in a second you're going to see all of a sudden you'll see stuff go kind of out towards the side, like that, all right? That's because the main engines, we're looking up at this point. So the main engines are looking down. So here we're looking up, and this is the next stage of the rocket, all right? So we have, a, we have the first stage that's down here, you see this yellow part, and that's the second stage of the rocket. Now they really let the engines, watch how fast this thing goes away. All right, and the two pieces that come off are a fairing that's on top of the satellite. So look how fast it's going. That engine is the the rocket, the part of the rocket motor there. That's the part of the rocket motor that we slammed into the moon, a thing that flew away. Right, that's called the centaur. It's part of the upper stage of the rocket. They make rockets in multiple stages. This is a two-stage rocket. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when the Okay, so there was the, the rocket motor that you just saw right there slammed into the moon, and then our satellite with all the cameras and the and the measurement devices and stuff all followed it in. Now we, we're going too fast. We're also going 5,500 miles an hour. You can't get away from the moon if you're going straight down. You can't, you know, go back that way. You don't have enough rocket fuel left, right? So we followed it in. So we came all the way down, and the rocket motor hit. It basically blew up because it was going so fast and it's pretty, pretty heavy. And then we. We saw the plume, and five minutes later, we came in, and our satellite is in pieces on the bottom of that crater in the moon. All right. So there's a couple of neat pieces about that. In that, we had some we had some extra things. Uh, we built some hardware that we had built before, and so we had some places where circuit cards would go that we didn't need them. Right. So we had to but we had to put metal plates in there to make the box the right stiffness. So those metal plates didn't have any circuit cards on them. So what we did is we we worked out with a company that they engraved all of our names on those metal plates. And they did it for free because they got to put their name on the metal plates too. Right? So it didn't cost Northrop Grumman anything. It didn't cost NASA anything. The taxpayers didn't pay for it. It was just kind of a barter that we did with this company that did the engraving. So that was pretty cool. So I tell people that my name is on the moon. Twice. There's two different metal plates that have my name on it that are on the moon. They're in pieces. You might never find them, but my name's on the moon. And in fact, the only person that I know of whose name is on the moon more than mine is President Richard Nixon. Neil Armstrong's name is only on the moon once. Oh, <laughs> so. name on the moon more than I had two different metal plates that have my name engraved on them, and they both hit with that satellite. It blew up, they kind of shattered, they're probably in pieces, but you can probably find the pieces. We, we think that they kind of just kind of broke up. They didn't really, you know, weren't really dust, you know, when we were done. Yes? What do we do with the water? Well, it just fell, it went up into the moon's uh, atmosphere. The moon does have a little bit of an atmosphere. So it went up in the moon's atmosphere, but most of it just fell back down in that crater. All right. Yeah? How many times has President Nixon had his name on Well, probably six, because he was president. I'm pretty sure he was president during all six manned moon landings. But he may have it more than, more than that, because there are other robotic rovers that landed that landed like before the Apollo astronauts landed. And in fact, they went and found one of them that was called Surveyor, so, yes? How hard is the water pressure to get you up there? How hard is, what, I'm sorry, what water pressure? Like, how hard do you have to water to take it down to get you up there? To get it up in the, to get it up in the air? Mm -hmm. um, the water, well, we, where we hit was only 30 degrees above absolute zero. All right, so the water ice that's down there is hard as a brick. That water ice is like it, harder than concrete. Okay, so when we hit that, it it blew up as as shrapnel and dust, and 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 then when it hit the sunlight, it got hot. So all that water became water vapor. All that ice, that hard ice, became water vapor. Yeah. Yeah, the rocket hit the moon. Okay, so there's a rocket, there's a rocket motor, and there was a satellite that we used to control the rocket motor. And so once we got it right on the line where we said this is where it needs to go in order to hit the crater, we separated from it. Alright? So we separated from that and we let it go. And it at that point it's just a brick, right? It's just flying along on gravity. There's there's no control. Once we let it go, 
it just floated into the moon and landed in the crater. Now we have a satellite behind it that has cameras on it and we're watching it. All right, but when we hit it, when we hit the moon, we were five minutes, four and a half minutes away at 5,500 miles an hour. So we were like 500 miles away, straight up, right? So we're going, we're going straight down, you know, and boom, we see the explosion, little tiny, little tiny boom, because it's 500 miles away, it's hard to see things that are 500 miles away. I mean, think about, think about trying to see, um, like, New York from here, okay? <laughs> yeah, trying to see a swimming pool in New York from here. That's what it's like trying to look at the explosion, because that's about how big that explosion was, or when that rocket body hit the crater, it was about the size of a swing pool. It made a crater about the size of a football field. Okay, um, but the explosion itself was only about the size, really about the size of a big swimming pool. So we were trying to see a swimming pool from here to New York, and we did see it. It was very hard, but we did see it. We had to kind of, we had to go back and look at things again to make sure that did we really see what we thought we saw? Yeah, we did. Yes. Did you like zoom in on the video to see it? They did. They zoomed in, and then they also had to change the contrast. You know what I mean by contrast? The the relative levels of dark and light, they had to brighten it way, way up so that they could say, oh, look, you know, right there, one frame, two frames, three frames, four frames. There's three frames of all of the digital pictures that we took. There's three pictures that had a white spot right where we expected it, and then the white spot was not there, it was there, it was gone. So only three frames, so we only saw it for about three tenths of a second, right? Yeah. No, they did not. <laughs> so, huh? no, there was no people on that. It was just a satellite, okay? And so what is on the outside of the rockets is insulation, all right? That rocket runs on hydrogen and oxygen. Some rockets run on kerosene and oxygen, but like everything that catches on fire, you need three things. Anybody know what three things you need? What? Right? Oxygen. So... In some rockets, they use hydrogen as the fuel, and they use oxygen and an igniter, right? And in some, they use kerosene, oxygen, and an igniter. And then some of them, they actually use rubber. And instead of oxygen directly, they use something called nitrous oxide, which has nitrogen and oxygen mixed together in it. It's more, it's kind of like what the atmosphere, the air that we breathe, right, is about three quarters nitrogen and, and about one quarter oxygen, right? Um, Nitrous oxide is one-third nitrogen and two-thirds oxygen, so it's a higher mix of nitrogen. Uh, sorry, it's a higher ratio. Uh, ratio, you guys know what ratio is? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's a higher ratio of oxygen to nitrogen than what we breathe because oxygen is what you really need, but it's really easy because you don't have to get it cold, as cold to be a liquid. Liquid, liquid oxygen is like 250 degrees below zero. Nitri nitrous oxide is only about, uh, I think it's liquid, actually it'll liquefy it at room temperature if you compress it a lot. So you don't have to get it really cold, it's a lot easier to deal with. Yeah? Has there been a girl astronaut yet? There have been a very large number of girl astronauts. There are some great ones. Sally Ride was a United States astronaut. There have been um, quite a number of um, Russian cosmonauts uh, who were women. Um, uh, Dr. Mae Jemison. Um, there was a, a, a pretty famous astronaut uh, who died actually in space, who was a woman. There was two different ones that, that, that died in space and were women. Um, and uh, there was two different space shuttle accidents and there was a woman on each flight. Maybe more than one. I'd have to, I think there was only one woman on each flight. Somebody's going to get me in trouble for that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so yes, there's, there's been a lot of women. Um, and in fact, there has been a woman commander of the International Space Station, and there has been a woman uh, chief scientist on the International Space Station. So, yeah, go ahead. Has there ever been, has there ever been like a, like when you launch up a rocket, has there ever crashed and malfunctioned? Yep. Early on, when NASA was designing and developing rockets early, there was a lot of them. Look up, uh, you just go to, go to the internet and look up rocket, rocket explosion. 
on the internet, you'll see some great videos. Stuff goes up and goes, you know, and goes up and goes back down and turns over and falls back to the ground and it just explodes in this huge fireball. Isn't that great fun? Yeah, yeah, some of those videos are fun. <laughs> All right. So, um, we talked a little bit about spectrum. We've talked about ground truth, right? Um, and we've talked a little bit about um, all the kinds of science that we do, both looking up and looking down. What I want to talk to you a little bit now is engineering. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. So I can talk about a couple of different interesting pieces of engineering. I have some real, I have some real stuff here. I have some toys too, but I have some real stuff. All right. All right. So. Oh, cool. What my big circuit board for? Oh. I know it's here somewhere. All right. So my company, my part, my my group within Northrop Grumman actually builds spaceflight hardware for NASA and other people. This is a circuit card that we designed and built that is uh, going into space. I'm not certain off the top of my head what piece of, what satellite this is on. This may be a power system uh, card that's uh, flying on a program called SIBRS, a space-based infrared uh, satellite. This piece of aluminum, and these don't match, but um, this piece of aluminum is kind of typical of the way that we build these cards. If you see the front side of this card, this is where all the parts go, right? You see the back side of this card, there's no parts, there's no circuitry, there's no parts on it. So what we do is we take these metal heat sinks and we glue two cards to it like this, all right? There'll be one on this side, one on this side, and one on that side. And then those go into a, they slide into a box and they attach on the top and the bottom. Now the reason that we do that is it's really hard to get stuff cold in space if you have the electronics turned on because electronics generate heat. Right? If you were to put your hand right here, you could feel my laptop's pretty warm. And it's, there's a fan blowing right here, right? And, and, on, and on, this, uh, on this projector, there's a lot of heat. All right? I can, feel, I can feel that heat out to here. On a satellite, there's no fan. Why would we not have a fan? What do you think? Might freeze? Not quite. Anybody else? Why would we, why would we not have a fan on a satellite? What do you think? Yeah? It might dissolve. Now, what do you think? Um, because there, it'll just take more energy up. It will take more energy up. What's coming out of this fan? Um, air. air. What do we don't have in space? Air. So why would we have a fan? For no reason. No reason. All a fan would do is consume power, generate more heat, because the motor would generate heat, but it wouldn't do anything to cool us off. Right? So the only way that we can cool things off with the parts on this side that generate heat is we can conduct that heat into this metal plate, right? And then that metal plate is attached to a metal box, and that metal box is attached to a metal plate, and that metal plate radiates the heat out into space. But that's the only way to get the heat out of it, so that's how we build circuit cards. This is a, uh, a front panel, okay? So there would be connectors that would go in here, and this would be mounted on the front of the box so we can hook things to it on the outside. I think I got one other circuit card in here I can show you guys. Yeah, this was a fun one. All right. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's a big processor chip. This is from a couple of years ago. Uh, and then, again, you can see there's this card, and there's this metal heat sink, and then there's another card on the back, right? So um, this, which processor is this? Yeah, this is actually flying. There's a bunch of satellites that are using this, that are flying in space. This, this probably has about a hundred of the computing power of my cell phone, all right? So my cell phone is a hundred times as powerful as this processor, all right? The most, the most powerful computer that we can fly in space today that'll last a long time runs at like a hundred megahertz. Now you guys probably have computers at home like this one. This runs at three gigahertz. All right, 
That's three billion computer instructions per second. The, the one I'm using runs 100, 100 million. So this is 30 times as fast as what I can fly in space. And the one I can fly in space, that processor card costs $500,000. That probably costs more than most of the houses that any of you live in. It may not be true for everybody, but more than my house, and I have a pretty nice house. That one processor card, that one card is $500,000. Yeah. Uh, that would be bad if the chip blew up while it was flying. And we go through we go through a lot of effort in engineering to make sure that doesn't happen. So as you can see, we have we have people who do electrical design. All right, so we have electrical engineers. We have people who do mechanical design. We have mechanical engineers. We have people who figure out how much heat's going to be in and out of this car. So we have thermal engineers. All right. What's that? Yes, it has. Not to anything that I've ever worked on, fortunately. My, my group is very, somewhat famous for never having had a satellite failure on orbit. So none of the things that we've ever built have failed. All right. So let's think about some of the other things we saw. One of the other things that we saw on one of the rocket fairings was art. Right? Yeah. So it takes, what does it take to go into space? It takes everything. It takes art. That first video had music, right? So it takes music in order to do community outreach, things like this, right? It takes, you saw that one video, the first video? What was there? That was next to the ocean, all right? So there's environmental concerns, so there's environmental engineers. There's people working on those rockets. So you've gotta have places for those people to park and drive and work and do things like go to the bathroom, right? So you have civil engineers. All right, you have building engineers. You have people who build the rockets. You have chemists. And I tell people, and, and you guys are gonna laugh at this. Satellites are like opera. I told you we were gonna laugh. All right, opera. What does it take to do an opera? Anybody here ever seen an opera? Who's seen an opera? Let me see hands, people who have seen an opera. Have you seen it live? Who's seen an opera live? Okay, so it takes, what does it take to do an opera? Singers, actors. Orchestra, people to write the music, people to do costumes, people to do makeup, people to do lighting, people to do sound, people to do art for posters. It takes everything in all of the arts and a lot of technology just to do opera. Well, the satellites are like the same thing because it takes people who understand radio communications. It takes all the scientists who want to do science with the satellites because most of the time you don't want to send a satellite up that isn't doing science because it's really expensive, so you want to do something while you're up there. So it takes anything that you can bring, okay? I'm a musician, all right, as well as a software engineer. I run a recording studio. It's one of my part-time hobbies, okay? I play guitar, I play saxophone, I play bass guitar, and I sing, all right? I sing in my church every Sunday. So I'm a musician, I've written some music about space, and I've played a bunch of music about space, all right? What's that? I can sing, I'm not too bad. Sing, sing, sing. Uh, not, with a, not without a guitar. Somebody got a guitar? I thought I saw a guitar here. No? That's a big Oh, a bass. All right. I thought I saw somebody walk in with a, with a guitar. Okay. Not this time. We're, we're, we're actually running over here, so you guys have, have got it. Have got to get back to uh, whatever the next thing it is that you're going to do. All right. I know that some of you still have questions, and your teachers have been looking out. All right. Um, you just announce who we want to come to lunch, or no? Okay. Okay. So your teachers will let you know, and we will meet you in the, in the courtyard. Okay. So Miss Payne and Fernandez's class, you need to go to lunch. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right.